go. All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are around the world. Welcome back to another Telegram team chat where I bring on members of the Solve Care team and ask them your questions. Uh, today we're joined by Hijaz Radzi. Uh, hey, Hijaz, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm good. Uh, you can just call me Jazz if that's easier, but it's up to you completely. Cool. All right, Jazz. So we have some questions here for you. And normally I go into like a little bit of how you join the company, but it seems like uh, we have some questions here for you on that. So let's jump straight into it and I'll interject some random questions along the way. Um, but yeah, it's good to have you here. So let's start off. We have a question from Godwin. Godwin asks, what inspired you to pursue a career in content creation and communications with software? Okay, well, this is sort of a journey. I'm not going to say, you know, my whole life led to this, but uh, I've always been sort of a tech geek. Uh, you know, I built my first computer when I was like seven. That's back in like Windows 95 days in the early 90s. Uh, and ever since then, I've always been sort of into what's the newest tech, what is going to propel, what's going to come up next in the world, you know, what's going to move the economy or industries in the world. Um, so I sort of got into crypto in, I would say I was not too late. I mean, I was there when Satoshi mined the first Bitcoin in 2009. You know, I was already like on the scene, waiting, watching. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and ever since then, I sort of, you know, I dabbled. Um, I've never myself been really interested in the whole remittance or like payment aspect of crypto. I've always been more interested in the blockchain systems, like what you can do with that, you know, because... Uh, for me itself, payment is not the most important part of this technology. Yes, it lets it helps it, but for me, it's what you can do with it, how you can improve the world, sort of thing. Um, as to how I got into content creation and communications at Solvecare, uh, I do have a background in that. I, I used to be a content creator, and I used to do a lot of uh, multimedia design. I worked at a marketing firm before, um, and so the artistic creative aspect of it kind of meshed with my. Uh, interest in technology and crypto at the time. So that is how I ended up here after learning about software from a friend. <laughs> oh, very nice. So you found out from a friend and then you just came on and you applied? Yes, uh, I did. <laughs> um, very nice. My friend, yes. My friend also happens to work here, so it <laughs> kind of led me naturally, you know, because uh, at that time, it was, yeah, COVID hit, right? But then by the time that hit, I, w I wasn't working for two years because I was just like, I need a break. Uh, sort of did my own thing, content creation, streaming, you know, all that. A lot of D&D &D in my downtime. But I got bored and I was like, you know, this looks interesting. And healthcare is something I'm very passionate about. You know, <clears throat> I had a lot of health problems when I was a kid. Uh, and we all know, if you've experienced the healthcare system, no matter where you are, it is a pain. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so if you guys are wondering, yes, I am recording from inside a Georgian prison. No, I'm just kidding. It's just my Airbnb <laughs> wallpaper. And yeah. Telegram doesn't have a uh, virtual background yet, but I like your background. Did you, you said you streamed? Yes, I did. <laughs> Hence the uh, soundproofing and... Uh, the mics all over the place <laughs> but yeah i i know that the first time the community saw you uh, i can't even remember what we were announcing but you did a video back in the day and i think it's the first time i've ever seen you I, so <laughs> i don't yeah, remember what it was, was uh, it, uh it was gth -E. oh okay very nice cool yeah all right yeah. so let's jump on to the next question this question is from mary kitty um, in your experience, what are the biggest challenges faced by content creators today, and how do you overcome them? Okay, so uh, challenges always change over time. I mean, I guess one of the challenges that have been going on for quite a while now is oversaturation. You know, it's so easy to create something, obviously not always of quality, but of quantity and just like throw it out there so many platforms you can go to uh, and all these platforms sort of 
fragment your audience as well, you know, because some people, you know, prefer Telegram. Some people prefer Facebook. Um, it's, it's oldies, I guess. Uh, and then uh, some people, you know, Twitter, threads. So you kind of have to find a way to access all these social media platforms and all of these different mediums at the same time, which is a lot more work than you think it is because you got to sort of alter your content slightly for each platform. So, you know, you got to find a way to like write the same thing 10 different times, 10 different ways, which I'm sure you've experienced, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think, and then, yeah, go ahead. go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. It's like I, I send Hijaz this really long telegram announcement that I wrote and he has to try and figure out how to write it for Twitter in, you know, 260 characters. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, nowadays, you know, within the last year, you know, you've got to compete with uh, AI generated content as well, <laughs> which, which, I wouldn't say it's a challenge. I mean, AI is a useful tool for us as well to work on stuff, but it doesn't always provide the content you need. And then the content that goes out through AI is very basic and kind of just clutters the space of real messages. Yeah, definitely. And, and you're working on something new, like, you know, what we're building, it doesn't have information, good data on any of it. So, yeah. Yeah. Which is great. I mean, in, in what I think, you know, it's a challenge. Uh, you can always come up with new things. Yeah. Cool. All right. So the next question is from Ben Ben. Uh, they ask, how do you ensure consistency and maintain brand voice across different communication channels and platforms? So perfect question for that. Oh, this is, this is actually a great question. Also, uh, Good learning experience for anyone who wants to get into sort of marketing advertising, especially in an in-house for any company. Um, most companies I've worked at, including Solcare, they have this thing called the brand guidelines. This is a very, very long document. Uh, I've, I've seen like 100 pages before in different companies. It will go over everything from font to the kind of messages you want to write to the kind of emotions you want to evoke what colors you can use, you cannot use, things like that. So that is our Bible for what we do in advertising and marketing. You follow that. Um, of course, there's always going to be some uh, changes that you want to make depending on what you're talking about or who you're talking to. But the essence of the messaging is always the same. It's always uh, what your company wants to project to the world and what they have been projecting this entire time. And this sort of builds a, uh, what's the word? Not notoriety, but a sort of image that's burned into whoever uh, looks at any of our content or any of our products or anything like that. That message should always be portrayed in, like, in the back of their mind. Yeah, it gives that kind of brand awareness. You're, you know where it's come from, mm -hmm. coming from as soon as you, you look at it kind of thing. Yeah, it's, a, it's very interesting. I did see our branding documents. I don't think I went all the way through it, but I know it's not as intense as some of the other ones I've seen. <laughs> yes, yes, it's not. Yeah, but no, we get a lot of freedom, which I'm happy for. So, and we're still, we're still I mean, relatively as a company, we're still not that old of a company. So we're still developing new uh, ideas, new uh, brand imagery and messages and things like that. So it, it's a good start. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the next question we have is from G Mellon. Uh, they ask, how important is data-driven decision-making in your role? And how would you, how do you use data to improve content and communications? Oh, definitely. Uh, Data-driven decision-making is a big part of a role. I think it is in anything a company does, but particularly in marketing, uh, it's all about learning from the past, what does well, what doesn't do well. Um, for myself personally, before I got into 
uh, content creation and communications. I actually worked uh, at SAS in big data, and I think we lost Mike. I don't know. <laughs> oh, you're <I'm>... back. <laughs> yeah, okay. Anyways, as I was saying, uh, yeah, before content creation and communications, I used to work in big data at SAS. So uh, data-driven decision-making is ingrained into me. <laughs> so we try to, you know, what I try to do is, you know, keep records of, okay, especially when it comes to social media, you have the obvious, you have, you know, how many likes, how many retweets and things like that. But then what's more important, I think, in today's climate is sentiment analysis. So you kind of have to really dig into and analyze what people are saying, not just how many people are saying it. And then you use that to sort of decide how to move forward. And then, um, yeah, so that's how you learn what works and what doesn't work. It's always useful. Uh, it's great for, especially like even, it's good for others to, in the company itself to know as well, you know, because they could be adapting to something completely different than what you're doing and it's not working. So that's just basically a waste of time. So to be more efficient, it's better if everyone knows what works and what doesn't. Yeah, we're, we're definitely a team of KPIs and reports and looking back <laughs> yeah. at what we did and where we could fix it and things like that. Yeah, I know. We get, we have a lot of reports. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next question. This is from <laughs> Rosemary. Uh, they ask, uh, with the rise of various content formats, as in video, podcasts, written articles, etc., how do you decide which medium is most effective for the given messages and audience? Okay. Uh, this is an interesting question for me. Um, Obviously, it does depend on who, despite the medium, it depends on who the audience is. You know, if you're going to talk to uh, other businesses, other VCs, CEOs, etc., they're probably not going to look at, like, some some meme marketing, you know. Um, they might <laughs> on their off time, but they're not going to gain any information from it. Um, we try our best to sort of have a shotgun approach and, do every single type of media possible. Even for like a single announcement, you know, we'll have videos, we'll have podcasts, we'll have written articles, blogs. Uh, this sort of helps to spread the info and people, and we understand that people take in information in different ways and they have ways that they prefer and ways that they don't like, you know, uh, especially nowadays, not a lot of people like to read long form. It's too much time, too much effort. So we try to do as many uh, formats as possible. Um, obviously, you know, how, how much we write, how we write, or how much information is packed into these messages depends on the audience. Um, this is actually one of the challenges of what we do in marketing for self-care because Healthcare and crypto are two very, very different monsters. So different. Healthcare itself, oh. yeah, moves slowly. It's very regulated. Uh, everything is about as much information as possible. Crypto is the complete opposite. Uh, you can basically do whatever you want. <laughs> uh, you, know, you know, like memes are popular. That's why we have meme coins being so popular. Um, yeah, so when you try to merge those two together is you're trying to write short form content, but there are so many things you cannot say when it comes to healthcare. This is why we don't talk about price in any of our groups or any of our messaging. Uh, we can't, you know, give out any information about uh, partnerships and things like that beforehand. So that's just the sort of decision-making that we have to make when it comes to uh, effective mediums. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's tough for us because crypto and, you know, healthcare are so vastly different. And then you tie in the fact that we're trying to be one of the most compliant tokens out there. And yeah. 
yeah, it, it's really hard for us to say certain things. We have to reread everything we write and make sure there's no words in there. We can't say things like that. So it's it's very tough. But yeah, the the crypto audience and their type of content they like compared to the healthcare audience is so much different. It is a challenge. And I respect you for what you do. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on. We, we, yeah. have, we, we work quite a lot together to try to uh, hammer that out though. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> We're on calls a lot. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the next question is from Toyo. He says, how can you make your content not only inform informative, but also reassure, uh, reassuring for patients and healthcare providers in this era of telehealth and remote care? Okay, so, uh, yeah. This is, I would say it does tie in a bit to the previous question. Uh, yeah. So when it comes to telehealth and remote care, I would say we're in a good time for it because, you know, there wasn't much trust in it before, but post COVID there has been a lot more trust and acceptance of telehealth and remote care. And a lot of more people are listening and looking specifically for that information. So, and we would reassure them the same way we would as if it wasn't telehealth, as if it was just, you know, like uh, talking about a hospital or a health service uh make sure they get the information that they need in a way that they understand so don't overburden them with you know like technical terms all the time just straightforward what is the message what they can receive from what we are selling essentially yeah and it's interesting uh, cuz yeah. you know everyone's living out of apps now so to have our yeah. our platform is a perfect time to come around where you know, we make a platform where you can manage all your healthcare, you know, a big, big issue for everyone. And you can do it all in one app. You know, that's the kind of thing that we have to sell to them. It's, it's never the, oh, well, it runs on blockchain and there's zero knowledge in the background. They don't want to hear that. They want to hear why should I yeah. use it? You know, what's yeah. important to me. So, yeah, it's interesting because we have, we're content creators. You know, I write content. Hajaz writes a lot of content. Um, but we focus, we have other marketers that are focused on local areas and how they do content is, is much different from us. And yeah, yeah. so it's tricky. Yeah. Especially when you're trying okay. to, uh, so let's move on. healthcare is such a, sorry, I was just going to add that healthcare is such a, uh, local issue for people, you know, like it's about the immediate vicinity, but when you're trying to do that on a global scale, you kind of got to, uh, try to adapt to each region, each local, each locality. And this is where like, you know, healthcare networks that people can make themselves uh, flourish. So they, they can get mm -hmm. what they need, where they need it. Absolutely. All right, so the next question we have is from Ebenezer. Uh, how do you balance the need for clear, accurate information in healthcare communications with the rest uh, with the need for engaging and accessible content for a wider audience? It's a similar question. Yeah, similar question. But uh, there is a bit more to say about this uh, on our end. I suppose um, if you notice, like in all of our announcements, you know, our announcements are made to go out to a wider audience. But pretty much every announcement has a uh, attached link or something that will go to a blog or an article that has the more informative aspect of that announcement. You know, so we do get the message out there that this is happening and this is what you can do. And most people are happy with that, but there's always people who want to learn more. So, you know, then you can go to our blog that we wrote about the announcement or the partnership or whatever. And then you'll see more of the details specifically for that, for those who are more, uh, who want more accurate information, uh, this one asks about healthcare communications specifically. So we do try to go into those details as well, like how you can do something. So we don't just say, you know, okay, here's care wallet, here's a network. There it is. We, we try to inform people, okay, how exactly can they use this network? How exactly in the app, what are the steps they need to take to 
uh, take part in the network, etc. Yeah, definitely. It's a wide audience in, in just the crypto blockchain space as well. You have some people, when we announce a partnership, they just want to know the name and that's it. You know, and then we have some that really want to understand how they're going to integrate into our platform, how they're going to use soft token and things like that. But yeah, in the healthcare industry as well, you have people that are, you know, just work in the industry. There's people who own healthcare businesses and things like that, and they all have their own uh, perspective on things. Very interesting. And whenever we announce things, it doesn't matter what kind of content we put out. I always get a lot of private messages from people, you know, in the industry or whether they're just blockchain enthusiasts and they ask a, a range of questions. So it never seems like we can hit every audience with the content we put out there, but we're always trying to make it as broad as possible. All right. All right. So the next question we have is from me. Oh, were you going to say something, Joss? No, I just said definitely. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, the next question we have is from Chigozi. Chigozi asks, as a content and communication specialist in a global company, how do you manage the different time zones and cultural differences? Okay. So uh, my interpretation of the question, I told Mike earlier when I saw this question, it's like, it was about internal communication between the company within the company and how we handle sort of all our tasks and content communications um, with the multiple time zones, language barriers, and cultural differences. Uh, obviously, the cultural differences haven't really seen it as a problem at all. I don't think so. Have you, Mike? I don't think so, right? No, uh, not too much so far. Yeah. As for the time zones, when it comes to communications, uh, we're all pretty scattered around the world. Um, we have people in that covers and overlaps pretty much every time zone we need if there's something that needs to go out. Um, of course, when it comes to marketing, this is not like software specific, but when it comes to marketing on a global scale and any MNC, uh, you got to be ready for that call. You know, like late uh, late night, you're having dinner, and you're like, "Oh, you get a call. This is urgent. Something needs to be done." And that's that's okay. You know, it's expected. Uh, it's not something you can really get away from in this kind of environment, no matter where you work. Um, but thankfully, you know, our team is super friendly. Uh, we're all always okay to you know go the extra mile, and. We don't really have any language barriers as far as I know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't I don't yeah. see it as a huge problem. Uh, and of course, you know, with social media nowadays, you can pretty much schedule anything. So you can always schedule in advance. It works out fine. Yeah, you do get some weird hours sometimes with meetings for sure. Like um, yeah. sometimes I've had a meeting at, you know, midnight and you just yeah. understand that they're on the west coast of the U.S. and I'm very far away. And, um, you know, whenever we're doing announcements for, you know, that's geared toward the Korean community, we're always, you know, yeah. posted earlier because they are ahead of us, things like that. But Definitely. not too many cultural differences. And we mostly hire people that speak English, so we don't have too many language barriers either. Um, but, yeah, that's a great question. So the yeah, next and question also, look, when it comes... Mary Sorry, <laughs> I was just going to add on that when it comes to like a lot of like our large partnership announcements or our partners, uh, when we get news about uh, new partnerships from our partnership managers and stuff, they're always traveling to make these partnerships happen or like they're going or they're going to conferences or anything like that. And sometimes we need to talk to them immediately. So we need to kind of cater to where they are at the time. And a lot of the big decisions are ones that they have to make. You know, like we can't announce a partnership ourselves without confirmation from both us and the partner that we're working with. And those partners can also be anywhere in the world. So we kind of have to find a way to work that out. Yeah, even when we sign the agreement with them or, you know, the contracts with them or whatever, there's still the when can you announce it, the communications and stuff like that. Yeah, it's... Like, and it can be really I, I nuts. Would say, I would say that we are very 
easygoing and work well in that aspect. But when you deal with really large corporations, their uh, their approval list of who needs to approve something is so long that it takes forever. And we're ready on our end. We're just waiting for the go-ahead. But yeah. It's like Hancom Francis, you know, we collaborating with them and they told us, what, three days, three days before. So we needed to post something the same day that we signed the agreement. But they sometimes they don't give us a heads up. And sometimes it's, oh, you have a heads up of months before you can announce it. So it's all different. <laughs> All right, let's jump into the next question. This one's from Mary Kitty. Uh, can you share some insights into the role of storytelling in effective communication and how has it evolved in the digital age? Great. I like that she said evolved because storytelling has always been an important aspect of effective communication. You know, since back in the day, you know, or, oral storytelling and then it goes on and on, especially in marketing and advertising. Uh, Today in the digital age, long form storytelling still exists. Like, you know, you see those uh, those really long Christmas ads or things like that, um, but not as much anymore. You know, people don't have the attention time for it, you know? And then now it's a lot, a lot of the like 15 second TikTok advertising is big now. Um, but what I find myself compelling is when you do make that kind of short form content, but it joins into a sort of longer form story. Uh, I don't know if you know that the very viral, uh, do you know what the Long Long Man ad is? It's like a Japanese candy ad. So they over a no, year, yeah, so over a year, every month they had like a different ad, but it was like a continuation of the previous story until there's like a twist at the end and then something weird happens. But I would say that is the most like, interesting way for me to do storytelling when it comes to advertising and marketing uh small bits and pieces that add up to a whole uh scene or whole story itself you know it finds a way to better like stick in your mind and you're like oh shit, that was interesting oh that one's interesting and then finally you get the realization oh it's one whole big pie rather than just a piece you know Yeah, definitely. We've had um, recently, you know, with release eight, release nine, and soon release 10, um, we've had to kind of build a story behind it because when we announce these features, you know, they don't, everyone doesn't connect the pieces right away. So yeah. could you explain more about the storytelling of just how we've tried to put all the pieces yeah. together for all these development updates and partnerships and things like that? Definitely, definitely. Um... All right, first thing I want to say is not everyone we try to reach is tech savvy, you know. Not everyone knows what zero knowledge is or, like, how exactly it works. So the best way to uh, sort of explain it to people is to put it into a sort of story form, you know, make it easier to understand, uh, let them know how it affects them or how it would affect them when they use it. Um, even though they don't see it, it's there, yeah. And also when uh, Mike was talking about, you know, release eight, release nine, like I was saying, these are all parts of a puzzle that fit into a larger story. They're all evolving elements. Uh, so remind me again. Okay. So release eight was uh, zero knowledge and then release nine was the community yeah. edition, right? Yeah. So we needed release yeah. eight and all its infrastructure to be able to do release nine, which is opening up to uh, programmers and the community so that they already have that infrastructure ready for them. So like I said, it's all part of, part of a bigger story and uh, how we tell the story is uh, through actually, you know, those blogs that Mike wrote were great, uh, very easy to understand and it flowed really well. And I thought we got our message across really well. Very nice. Yeah, it's tough because sometimes it can feel very disjointed, but there is a bigger picture yeah. behind it. And we try to bring it back, you know, try and remind people of how this came to be, you know, 
the clinical trials network that we're releasing is very much built upon the eligibility and enrollment package that our suite that we released in release eight, stuff like that. So yeah, it's a, it's a lot to think about at times. And we don't want the picture to fall away. We don't want people just to think, oh, we're just releasing another thing, another thing. No, this is all building toward one big picture, global adoption. Cool. So the next question we have is from Great Charles. Let me see if I, yes. Great Charles asks, uh, given your diverse roles, what advice do you have for individuals looking to excel in the field of content creation and communications across various platforms? Okay, so yeah, actually, re more even more recently, my roles have become even more diverse, <laughs> taking on like PR and uh, videos and things like that. But I would say the most important thing is you know don't be afraid to experiment and fail as long as you learn from it. Uh, obviously, don't try to go like way out of left field and try to do something without informing anyone. Uh, but yeah, so you need clear communication. Internal communication is a huge aspect. Uh, Mike knows this. We're always talking to each other constantly, the entire team. Uh, we're always checking, you know, this is how we want to go. Is it okay? Uh, what's everyone's input into it? Um, it's, it's marketing is not a solo, it's not a solo job, especially for a company and in house team. Uh, trying to think of more <laughs> more words of wisdom <laughs> uh definitely a lot of research goes into it actually it, i would say i would say our jobs are like 80 percent research 20 percent doing most definitely uh oh yeah we're always looking at what yeah. other projects are doing and what marketing is working for them and yeah it's crazy yeah you know you got to stay on top of trends uh, you don't always have to follow trends, but it's good to know what they are, you know. Yeah, definitely. So this qu next yeah. question kind of fits in. Well. Um, you talk about don't be afraid to try something completely different, but any Jacob asks, uh, what are some common mistakes or pitfalls to avoid in content and communications? Uh, so one of them I talked about was trends. Don't ignore them. People who ignore trends don't know the market. Uh, failing to understand your audience is a big thing. Uh, what could work in one place could completely fall flat somewhere else. You know, you we've I've personally experienced this when trying to talk to both crypto and healthcare, uh, especially when it comes to media and things like that. You know, some things work for one, some, some things don't work for the other, and you have to listen you can't not listen you have to adapt what you're doing to your circumstance and i i think being stubborn is one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of uh marketers and advertisers do you know they have this lane that they're on and they want to stay on it and they don't and they believe that it's the right lane even though they're trying to even though the audience itself is changing the audience changes not just based on who but when like you know Every year, something new comes up, sentiments change, uh, economies change, the political structure changes, and pe people's views change. So you kind of always have to stay abreast of that kind of uh, development. Uh, and, yeah. of course, a common mistake of to avoid in content communications, as I said before, is not communicating itself with your friend, with your uh, coworkers, with your audience, uh, audience communication is also very important. It's all about taking in as much information as you can and using it, no matter what the source is. Yeah, I have to just add to that. that it's also, you know, speaking to the higher ups as well. It's like I was writing about release nine and I was talking about the features and everything. And I was kind of, didn't really feel it. And then I had a 10 minute phone call with Pradeep where he just went over, you know, what exactly release nine means and it just all clicks. So sometimes it's, you know, yeah. go to the top, see why they did this and then yeah. you can get a better idea of what you're writing don't, about. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to ask. 
Most people, most people yeah. will will answer if you ask. Yeah. Okay, so the next one we have is from Crypto Badu. Uh, Crypto Badu asks, "What role do you see content and communications playing in driving the adoption and utilization of self care solution by both healthcare providers and patients?" Oh. I see, I see it playing a huge role in this, in uh, adoption because our content communications and anything we send out is going to, probably going to be the first point of contact for anyone who hears about soft care or like apart from, you know, learning from your friend or, or, or whatever, but mostly in any ads you see is how you learn about it. Any article written, that's how you learn about it. So all this needs to be clear, easy to understand and it's an incredibly important role to when it comes to adoption and utilization of software solutions. Cause you know, it's like the old saying, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and no one hears it, did it really fall or in more uh, contemporary terms, kicks or it didn't happen, <laughs> you know? So uh, yeah. Yeah. It's um, for us. I mean, Patients for us come mostly from the healthcare providers. You know, we market and write content specifically for our, you know, potential or prospective clients and they bring the patients in, but we will get to the point where we will have open networks that we're marketing for ourselves. You know, GTHE was what, like the first trial of um, care, care trials. To write. Yeah. Care trials will be the next, but we again for care trials we're going to be writing content that are for specific communities that are going out to individuals instead of this normal b2b marketing and content creation we've had before so we have a a lot new roles coming to us as well so <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right we are down to the last question so uh this question is also from crypto badu and they ask, um, how does Solve Care approach the localization and translation of content to cater to the different regions and languages? Okay, hey, so uh, as many of you know, we have two main official channels, Solve Care Global and Solve Care Korea. Uh, Solve Care Korea handles, our team in Solve Care Korea handles the uh, communications for them uh, specifically. We handle, and Mike here, you know, our community manager <laughs> is in charge of soccer global, but for all the other channels and localizations, uh, many of you know, but if some of you don't know, we do have a uh, software ambassador program, which should be in the welcome message to the software group, or we could also probably share it again later at some point. All right, Mike. Uh, uh, yeah. And yeah, cause we're actually, you can sign yeah. And you can sign up to this program. Uh, and we'll go over, and if everything looks well, you know, we'll contact you. And then most of those ambassadors handle localization for their own region. You know, we have like Arabic, we have Spanish, French, and that's that's sort of a community effort that happens. Yeah, you really can't just use translate. I mean, we learned that pretty early on with the Korean community. You can't even translate it into English and then translating it into Korean. They all just know right away you're translating it into Korean. So we have um, yeah, specific yeah. people in Korea that translate our stuff. And yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, as like, you know, <laughs> speaking multiple languages, definitely translators, like automatic translators are always kind of wonky when it comes to, especially tech. When it comes to tech, uh, it just doesn't really work. Um, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully one day we'll have a Japanese community and office in Japan, and I can I can move there and you know work there <laughs> and take care of that localization. Take care of that. But yeah, yeah, definitely. But yeah. All right. So since we're out of questions, I'm going to ask you a personal question. Obviously, don't leak any information. But what are you most excited for in this year? Oh, in this year, like personally. Yeah. <laughs> In regards to solve care, I'm not talking about a new oh, D &D I was like, okay, yeah. 
Uh, in regards to self care, is that I don't know. Things are just. Yeah, I've been in self care for a few years now, and this is the year that we're really kicking it up a notch. You know, we're really getting things out there. Uh, myself personally, I'm taking on a lot more hats, doing a lot more things that feel like are actually helping move self care along. You know, and I, I think that with care trials. It is the start of, it is really now the start of adoption and being able to, you know, sort of onboard people. I think that's huge. Yeah. Especially for, uh, f- yeah. for the company, I mean, we've been working on this for quite a long time now, so. <laughs> oh, you're muted. Yeah, and we've been wait, waiting for the first open network for a long time. I mean, we've been writing content for, you know, the blockchain side of things for so long, but now it's like, hey, come try us out, come use it. You know, that's the most exciting thing for us. You know, our content is not just maybe someday you'll get to try it. No, it's, you know, come check it out right now. So it's a, it's a big step for us. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, a lot more work for you and me too. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, always. When is it not more work, Hijaz? <laughs> uh, all right. So, um, since we're at the end of the questions, uh, wrap it up. If you have anything last, any last comments, or you want to say to the community? Uh, yes. Everyone, I work very hard on all those announcements. Please share them. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, just, yeah, stay tuned. We have a lot more coming. And uh, if you get the chance and you're in New York, go visit our booth at Mainnet 2023, uh, taking place at Pier 36. And thanks for watching, guys. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, stay tuned as we'll have another Telegram team chat soon. Uh, we'll see if Ed can make it. If not, we'll throw another poll out there. But thank you, Jaws, for coming in last minutes. I didn't give you much notice for this, so I'm glad you were able to come out. Anytime. Uh, thank anytime. you all for joining. Yeah. Thank you all for joining, and I'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.